Mark, my good friend, how are you today? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm getting a little tired. I've been balancing work, family, and uh, setting up the new tank, which finally arrived on Monday. Nice, so, nice. How long yeah. ago did you order that? I want to say end of January. Okay, that's not too bad. I, I know once yeah. upon a time it was like, oh man, trying to order any kind of custom glass, you might be looking at four, six months, up to a year, depending on how special it was. Um, but I'm really glad that you're finding some time for reef therapy because, uh, man, I've been getting a lot of feedback from people in the industry and in the hobby who oh, have not good. been you know, engaged or plugged into content per se. And I think uh, we're definitely resonating with some people. Um, as of this recording, our next topic isn't out yet, but ooh, I mean, that's going to be a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you got the folks that like the lighthearted stuff. That's n not too, um, not 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 too negative or cri critical. And then you got the folks that like the critical discussions. So it's, you know, it's a balancing act that I think we're we're doing a pretty good job and continue to try to just strive for. Right, is keep it light sometimes, but also, you know, question some things and and be critical about certain things in the hobby. Um, Can I, you know. Uh, we absolutely want to uh, balance things out and I want to talk a little just you know casually a little bit about some of my tanks and a little bit about your tanks but uh, today I got a package from a well-known vendor it was very well packed the corals are great and there was a one-page full-color instructions on how to acclimate corals oh man <laughs> <laughs> triggered <laughs> <laughs> well it's something I look for now I'm just like I, it's, I know that people think that this is something they should be doing, but this is just a carryover from acclimating freshwater fish, you know, from a pH of, you know, 7 to 7.5 or 7 to 6.5, you know, and I'm, I feel like it's just one of those holdovers that people haven't taken time to examine. I have not acclimated the over 1,000 corals that I have right now. I acclimate clams very well, shrimp very well, fish, it depends. If they've been shipped, you know, I'll do it right. But corals, plop, you know. And um, it's funny, as, as of this recording, the past topic hasn't come out yet, but I, I think I came up with a lot more misconceptions. Oh, me that too. We <laughs> so we're, gonna, we're, de we're definitely going to have to do a part two on that one, but space it out so we're not just sitting there uh, wagging our finger. Yeah, I had, um, <clears throat> I won't get into it too much, but uh, I have a little coral Q, Q tank, I guess, quarantine tank, but just mm -hmm. somewhere I can plop some new corals in and observe them and not immediately throw them into my tank. Or if I get some snails and stuff, I, I don't want them showing up with, you know, ick tomants on their shells and all that. Anyway, I, I sort of let Calerpro run rampant in there because uh, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, the, the big scary, the Calerpa went sexual happened, you know, and, get, oh. you know, which, which I've had happen before. And, uh, you know, it's like, okay, but it's just funny in such a small volume of water, we're talking 20 gallons, nobody cared. Right. I mean, as long as you got good filtration, good aeration, like nothing happens. And I don't, you know, it's just funny. It was ever toxic. I've had it. I've had like small pieces go sexual, like right in front of my eyes while I was watching it. And I don't think it's known to be toxic. It's just, you know, you lose all your calerpa. Um, yeah. The last time I had calerpa was rasmosa. But I thought you were growing prolifera, right? Prolifera and um, what's the one that uh, looks like seagrass almost? Like it's just Is like a blade grass. Is that Ooh, I don't know. Um, but you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, it's just funny. I, I, I was watching that go down, and I was like, oh, that's that's another one that I would have brought up in that uh, misconception is um, it certainly deserves a bad rap for what it's done in certain ecosystems, perhaps. And, you know, if you live in California, that's one thing. But, you know, the whole big fear of it going white and releasing all its guts, and, and I don't know. I just I think it's overblown. So. So I kind of <coughs> interrupted you started to just tell me about your, your new reef tank. Yes. Um, so tell me again, tell our viewers, or listeners again, the, the dimensions of it, 
what kind of tank and just what you're dealing with right now? Yeah, so it's it's rimless, um, pretty standard dimensions uh, when it comes to the glass, which is just a 180, right, a 6 by 2 by 2 um, mm -hmm. But I had them cut the overflow box lower. Um, <clears throat> I wanted it at 3 inches, but where they put the overflow teeth is a little bit below that, so we'll see where the water level ends up. But I wanted to do that just because, uh, one, I'm, I, I sort of – dig the shallower tank look not like the super shallow frag tanks but something a little more shallower i don't like rimless tanks where the water's right up to the water line and you get salt splashing and you know you run your magnet across the top and you got water splashing over i, I just that drove that, me crazy that is a real thing you know i can i can scrub all my tanks very aggressively until but i always start with the water line so i can do it real smoothly yeah. and slowly because but I always also always have like a, a towel with me because I know like that there's gonna be some splashing. Yeah, we'll see how it turns out. I, uh, I, you know, I remember Japanese tanks in the past when you would see like rimless Japanese tanks. They usually had the water line way below, and I always thought that looked pretty cool. Um, and I've seen some other examples of that, and I thought, you know, I, I'm just gonna do it. I, I lowered the water level on my my current tank just to get a vibe for it during like a water change, and I was like, that looks pretty cool. Like I could live with that. So, um, so that's really the the I, I guess fundamental difference between your your uh, you know if you were to go order a Planet Aquarium rimless 180. I did put the I overflow box in the corner. Half to one inch is kind of the norm, depending yeah. on how much water you run through the tank. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm curious to see w how much wave action, like yeah. actual wave making, you're going to be able to do with that tank, and uh, I, I do believe that the the Tunzi wave box patent is right around the corner from being expired. Not that you couldn't make your own, but man, I don't I don't think I've seen hardly any DIY boxes to help amplify that wave action. So. I'd be curious to see if uh, you might experiment with that at all. But tell me about the plumbing situation. <laughs> because when I got my Cade, I felt so inadequate because all I had to do was connect a bunch of pieces, yeah. but uh, <clears throat> pre-cut pieces and pre-everything pieces. But now you're like, oh, how do I plumb this thing? Yeah, I, uh, I've i never been a master plumber. I mean, you would never look at my plumbing jobs with reef tanks and sumps and go, you know, oh, that deserves to be on Instagram or whatever. <laughs> uh, but I guess I got spoiled with the Red Sea tank where I just screwed everything in. I mean, yeah, you had to assemble the stand, but after that, you were pretty much trucking pretty quickly. And um, now I'm sitting there looking at it like, how, you know, how, where am I going to put this drain pipe and that drain pipe and you know and then it, you you almost have to go at it iteratively like first let's get that figured out and then i know where i have space left to put maybe some other things right and so i'm just staring at it with this utter confusion and i anticipate you know i'll probably give it a go this weekend uh i anticipate there'll be a lot of cussing and <laughs> trying to get everything to fit perfectly but um and the other thing i found interesting is and again this is uh you know, we always had the corner overflow tanks, and now everybody's gone to a center overflow. I and, don't know what um, that's about. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why it's all center overflow. I, I don't either. I mean, you know, try getting a fish out of an overflow box that's in the center, right? Um, Yikes. But um, the other thing is now, because they have to manufacture the stands to accommodate that center overflow, the supports on the back of the stand are off-centered. And you go, okay, that's, that makes sense because you don't want to get in the way of the plumbing. But the problem is, you know, back in the old oceanic days and stuff, you would always be able to fit your sump in diagonally and kind of have it stick out the back a bit mm -hmm. before yep. you then dog-legged it in, you know, or is that the term you use? Like where you, you, you kind of got to get that edge in by you sticking wang, it. Wang, jangle it in. Yeah. I, can't do, <laughs> I couldn't do that because of the wet – you know where the door openings are and then the back off center supports are there was no i mean i even thought well maybe my sump's too big what if i go with like a, a three foot sump which for a six foot tank right i mean i don't want to go much less than that um so i did a template of a three foot sump and i couldn't get it in 
And their website does say that you can temporarily remove one of the front braces uh, mm-hmm. to get your sump in only while the tank's empty. But of course. I got to admit, I thought that was kind of like, come on, man. You know, for, for everyone that's buying these tanks and putting sumps in them, I was a little surprised that you'd have to take the su- a support piece out of your stand. I mean, I guess the Red Sea tanks are sort of that way now, too, yeah, with those you know, metal. I'm, I'm going to call you out for that one. I think it's not that big a deal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I actually have a, a custom main stand that has one of the supports on a hinge. Oh, really? It's like hinged in the middle, and you can unscrew it and then screw it back together. This was a custom tank, but it definitely allows for uh, a much bigger sump to be put in there. Um, definitely send me some, send me some you know, snapshots or whatever of I what will. you're thinking uh, as far as plumbing. Because, man, I'm, I know you've seen these sumps uh, promoted online, and <coughs> people get really proud of their colored PVC and their what I would consider like excessive plumbing jobs. Yeah. Like they're treating the plumbing like it's cabling. And they're also plumbing the tank like they've never heard of a 45 degree elbow. Yeah. That drives me nuts. Like, you know, you have this sump that is very well presented. It looks pretty. It's got colorful PVC, maybe even like color coded. Or s- don't even get me started on Schedule 80. <laughs> Schedule 80 is like... I mean, if you have a giant tank or you're trying to really reduce vibrations, okay, that's that's cool. But, um, I mean, two th- elements that are really missing from what I'd consider master aquarium setups. Not talking about, like, the large 10 g size stuff, you know, not the commercial stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the consumer stuff, like, use some 45s and use some spa flex. You, yeah. Like, you just never know when, like, just a little bit of spa flex is going to be better than five freaking 90 degree elbows oh man like i I just lose all respect for i I don't want our viewers our listeners to take this the wrong way but man i really cast uh shade when i see a return pump that goes straight into like 290s well straight up into a 90 then to the side into a 90 and then straight up and i'm like okay you literally could have taken flexible pvc yeah. or 245s to not reduce your flow rate so much and it just gives you so much more freedom so definitely consider picking up some spa flex in the sizes that you'll be working with well and i i was sitting there thinking when did um when did flex tubing go out of style right i mean really on a return pump you know some some three-quarter internal diameter tubing you know, mm-hmm. so you can get it in black, right? So it's not like you have to worry about um, light growing things in it. But um, we'll, we'll see where I get. You know, I'll, I'll be cussing. So if a you lot. can't find Spa Flex, like I know that at um, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, like sometimes they'll kind of bottom out at one inch. Sometimes they'll bottom out at like an inch and a half. You know, mostly for like jacuzzi style installs. Um, but my go-to place has been Ace. Like, first really? of all, <laughs> I didn't realize that Ace, Ace was still around. Place. But then when I asked around, I was like, oh, yeah, Ace has it. And, yeah, sure enough, Ace had, like, half inch, three-quarter. It's been a minute since I've had to do some plumbing jobs. But there's just a few places. You know, everything's mostly rigid, um, regular for Schedule 40 PVC. But then there's just a few places just to do something a little bit tricky. It would have been just not practical to use hard plumbing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big flow through the sump guy, so I, to be honest, I haven't really worried too much about the friction in the plumbing uh, because, you know, most of the pumps, like the pump I use at full throttle is too much for yeah. my flow preference. So um, my my big thing is that it's not in the way, you know, like yeah. I've seen some jobs <clears throat> where you're like, how do you service the sump or your skimmer? How do you when do anything? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I've seen that. So. Or just like, you know, uh, liberal use of uh, uh, dual union ball valves. I'm like, all right. I mean, I get what, I get what you're trying to do. but um. And then last, last thing is, man, do not use a check valve. Almost everybody oh, that I yeah. know that counted on, a fla- on, a, on the, uh, the check valve, um, either a flapper or a Y, um, if, they ca- if they set up their plumbing and counting on that valve to stop the flow going back into their – their setup they just unless you, that thing is laboratory clean it just doesn't work in a reef aquarium setting I, i'll bet you the yeah. valve makers would tell you that like dude one grain of sand one tiny little worm and it's just not gonna work 
Yeah, I mean, that's where, you know, I always try to fit a decent size sump in to always accommodate the, uh, you know, the power outage situation of mm-hmm. the water draining in. And um, but um, but then, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I one thing I, I give props to Red Sea and I, is um, they usually have a, a dry area compartment for your electronics that mm-hmm. doesn't share. I mean, there's holes for the wiring, but well, it doesn't share the air with your sump as much, right? Very um, true. And that's just that's something I've come to expect. And, you know, you've seen that design kind of imitated where there's a dry electrical electronics chiller area that is totally separate. But on that reefer S that we talked about, it looked totally open. And I was yeah. like, kind of surprised by that. So maybe there's a partition there that we didn't see in the renders or maybe it's something optional. Um, but yeah, that is an element of a uh, stand design that is just not really appreciated. Yeah, and I, I was going to DIY something in my stand, and I, I spent all day trying to do that, and I gave up. I was, it's just, um, it looked kind of hokey because I'm not a great woodworker. But uh, one cool thing I found at Home Depot, and I'm sure a lot of reefers have already discovered this, but uh, that white pvc board that's like three quarter inch thick you can get it Mm -hmm. in 12 inch wide by eight feet long that stuff's great you know because it's waterproof you can screw it into your sump back wall to attach both plumbing or you know your your different electronic you know controls for your pumps and everything into it Mm -hmm. and uh that stuff's money i was i was pretty excited to discover that so i i picked some of that up and put it along the back wall so that I had have somewhere to mount stuff and so two more tips as you're uh, building this out um, man it was actually kind of fun when I was considering on a larger scale building everything at the studio because I had like 10 to 12 tanks to build or or more and so I came up with solutions for a lot of stuff um, you guys you know, know that I just I take cable management super seriously you know I like to hook up everything and then see what I have and then I will undo it all the wiring and then put everything in place. Um, but first mega pro tip is uh, get us some custom power cords Yeah. Um, that I sent you some links to earlier today. I appreciate um, I don't that, remember yeah. what, I don't remember what the website is called, but <coughs> every device you get is gonna get you know, come with you know pretty much like a six foot black power cord. And man, you got five or six or eight pieces of equipment that each have the six foot power cord. Like that's a lot of cabling that has to go somewhere. So if you get a custom power cord for $3 and it's one foot or foot or foot and a half or whatever you want, um, man, all of a sudden you don't have to manage it at all because it's just long enough and they're available in right angle versions also, both for the plug and for the connector. Um, and then what was the other one? Um, I, uh, what was I using? Some, some kind of like closet organizer baskets that I just kind of screwed onto one wall of the stand. Then I put my power supplies in there. Um, oh, that's a good obviously, idea. Obviously keep every, everything um, off the ground, but they're just like little wire baskets. So they're breathable. They're not, you know, the, the, the power supply is not going to get super hot. Pop one or two in there. And uh, man, you'd be surprised when you get those two things out of the way you, and, and you got your controllers mounted up. There's not much left to do. That's a really good point, actually, because I use the um, I, 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 last few tanks I've used that Panduit stuff, uh, yes, which yeah, is, uh-huh. yeah, you know, just wire management tracks. But um, the, the two things I always ran into is either the cord wasn't long enough. So then I was trying to source like slight, like not super long extension cords, but like, you know, hey, something that gives me like an extra foot maybe. Mm-hmm. But then the other part was uh in a lot of cases the cord going to like the power supply for the led was too much where i'm wedging a ton of of that power cable into that panduit and just trying to force it to fit but um it's just your standard like computer type cable on the other side right so Mm -hmm. you the the link you provided me i was looking at the different lengths if you just you know buy at four dollars i think they were uh three or four dollars you could buy a couple of different lengths and see what works and now you're not having to mash all that extra cable behind some plastic wire management thing to make it look pretty. It's it's the right length, right? So And you know, you can color code it. I think it's available in white, yellow, green, red, blue, 
it's 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 fun you know i don't want to make this entire <laughs> no, <laughs> episode no. about yeah. the, the pre-build <laughs> of your tank but i'll just thought we'd throw a few nuggets out there before you lay some smack down about feeding and nutrition so you ready to start the session mark sure let's do it all right why don't you take it away this time so tell, tell me what we what we're going to be talking about I guess the topic today would be about um, nutrition, feeding of both fish and coral. Um, mm -hmm. Dive into the different types of food people tend to use, uh, and also um, kind of question some some c common um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some common path, uh, common wisdom, or or just you know stuff that I think we we trying to be very diplomatic here um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we do want to be nicer <laughs> yeah just kind of questioning you know things like how much to feed and 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 some of the benefits that that people tend to assign to food right mm -hmm. um so god there's so many ways to start peeling this onion i don't even know where to start where do you yeah. want to start <laughs> i, I, I you guess know what? i'll yeah, fire off it. the opening salvo all right my fish get almost exclusively flake food. I, I mean, would, uh, I feed I, I feed high quality flake food with that with one jar. You know, I can pinch off little flakes or big flakes. I can feed the big fish, the small fish, um, the tiny little bits get caught by actual corals or anemones, um, and of course, you know, I, I have frozen food. Pretty much just my cis brain shrimp and, and blood worms because also have some freshwater fish. But that's like when I'm feeling good and I want to give them a treat or a holiday. So my fish will typically get, um, you know, a good helping on like Fourth of July, Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> and when they're new, when the fish are new, I think that's where frozen food really comes in to help them, you know, put the fat, the, their weight, their weight back on. But people when people say oh my fish won't eat flake food i'm like all of my fish eat flake food even, even like weird ones that you wouldn't think that it would eat flake food even my my leopard grasses you know they eat flake food and they eat pellet food um what do you feed your fish i you know <clears throat> i didn't do this intentionally for the last two decades it more came out of laziness and busyness but yeah frozen food for me was always a way uh, was used as a gateway to wean them onto dry pellet and flake. And once they were on, you know, if I acquired a new fish, I'd baby the hell out of them with mm -hmm. frozen food. But once I saw that fish eat pellet or flake, you know, end of story, um, I would always go to the store and buy frozen <laughs> food, you know, and kind of go home. It's kind of like buying vitamins at the store. Like, I'm going to take mm -hmm. these every day. There's a feel-good aspect to it. Yeah. And then... I, it would fall to the wayside because I'd be busy and I'd be like, yep. oh, crap, got to feed the fish, throw some pellets in, move, you know, continue on with my day. So my frozen food would just go, you know, it would get uh, frost, uh, freezer burn and just kind of go nappy after a while anyway. Um, and then, you know, decades later, you know, I, I, I reflected upon that. I think with you, we've had some personal conversations about this. I'm like, you know, I've had some pretty finicky, hard to keep fish that, I've kept for more than a decade on this lazy diet of mine, you know, and, and they've been great um, and they're healthy and they're my clownfish spawn and, you know, and everything's good. Um, in the last few weeks, I've been curious about this subject. So I've been feeding a little more frozen just to see out of curiosity if there was any observations from it. But I mean, they certainly like it, but I, I worry more about the, I'm more worried about the health effects of feeding too much frozen food than I am of feeding them exclusively flake, if you think about the pros and cons of each. If there was one mortal sin in the reef aquarium hobby, specifically reef saltwater, is people don't just overfeed their fish. They kill their fish with fro They kill their reef tank with frozen food, right? You know, I, I even you go to a store, like sometimes I'm going to have like this specimen cup that's got like a quarter to a half pound of all kinds of frozen food i'm like hey aren't you guys operating on margins over here like what are you doing <laughs> and but yeah definitely in the long term it, it will create fatty deposits and that's why it's funny how some of these rare fish collectors will have uh, 
great looking fish for a few years and then you don't really hear about their fish so much you know the best the best fish keepers seem to be a lot more laissez-faire probably because they feed them you know once a day or twice a day and a reasonable amount and not too much frozen food but you know it's, it's, it's almost like a child uh feeding a child analogy here where one you wouldn't feed your fish your <laughs> your child just like steak and ice cream right and then you also wouldn't give them ice cream because they wouldn't eat their vegetables, you know? And, yeah, uh, yeah that, 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 all the things that it leads to as far as, um, you know, fatty deposits in the fish, um, but mostly just waste, waste, waste in, in, the, in, in your reef tank. Well, so, you know, people like to talk about, you know, the <clears throat> comparisons to nature, right? And I, and you know, I've often heard a reef described as a uh, an environment high in food uh, or, in, you know, food availability and, and very high in export, right? It's essentially, um, there's a lot of food around for things to graze on and in the water column and plankton, but there's also a lot of current, you know, taking anything, you know, any, any, any byproducts away or whatever. So, you know, there's that argument that you should do the same in your tank, right? High import, high export, but in the sciences, we like to call that nutrient cycling. Right, but the <laughs> but the the argument is is like, whenever you start to say, well, I want to, you know, in, on a real coral reef, it's like your tank's nowhere near a real coral reef, right? First of all, <laughs> right. Um, so my analogy is always uh, like I like to go backpacking sometimes, and um, the amount of calories. I burn in a day where I'm backpacking, you know, 20 miles up and down trails is way more than the amount of calories I burn at home, right? Mm -hmm. So a 2000 calorie diet ain't going to cut it for me if I'm doing that. And so I, I don't know, you know, I think about like the fish in my tank and I don't want to get into like how many calories a fish consumes necessarily, but I don't think the surgeon fish that are in my reef are probably having the same caloric demands as say a surgeon fish on a reef with you know swells and wave currents and you know they're i mean I, i've heard you know like certain acanthorists travel like several miles a day and everything and they're fighting currents and well, stuff like that they could travel several miles a day and go nowhere right i mean they can go in circles in your tank but, but I, I love this direction that you're you're taking the, the conversation because i've always said that my fish in my fish tank and also to some lesser degree in my reef tanks, they have an endless treadmill because I always put a lot of flow in my fish tanks. But right. I guess it's true in my reef tanks too, where like, you know, my powder blue hybrid, he loves just sitting there in front of the MP40 and just swimming against the current as hard as he possibly can. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting way, interesting way of looking at it, how you're talking about the, um, the caloric requirements of, of activities. I mean, you know, the fish yeah. is just sitting there just swimming back and forth with, probably average you know, reef water flow which is less than a lagoon would be in the wild and it then all everything you're grow. feeding is also impacting the water quality that they're swimming in right so mm -hmm. weigh that with um the pros of, of of you know whatever you think that frozen food is providing um i yeah and i mean i get it look if you got antheus that you want to feed several times a day that makes sense right like they're they're that that's more natural to their behavior and whatever but i don't think people are are drowning their tanks in nutrients by free feeding baby brine shrimp though right <laughs> or feeding or, uh, daffy or calanus copepods yeah you know it's just these heaping servings of very rich uh, frozen foods you know like everybody's reefs are lrs and uh, rod's food you know it's weird because they're like undeniably some of the best nutrition but that doesn't mean you should feed your reef tank you know a big chunk of it twice a day every single day i mean there's beautiful reef tanks that uh, you know the 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 keepers of those reef feed heavily and you know that works for them it's just not for me personally it's it not, also it's not my cup of tea it also takes time yeah. Right? It takes time to get your reef tank to that level where it can really manage all those nutrients. It takes time for your fish to grow to that size, first of all. So, you know, when I started out the, mm, the Red Sea Max Nano Aquarium, dude, I fed those fish a pinch of flake like twice a week. 
But you know what? The corals have grown in a lot, and the fish have grown a lot, and now I feed them a pinch of flake twice a day. You know, and I, but in the, it's definitely in the beginning, especially if you're a new aquarist. You know, I, I'm taking more a nuanced stance on my, I guess, my prescription of how much food people should feed their tanks. But whatever you're, if, if you're listening to this right now, whatever you're feeding your reef tank, I guarantee you is too much. It's too much. It's too rich. Yeah, it's, and it's tough when you see somebody that just dumps a crap ton of food in and it works for them and they have a very dense biomass of corals and w- whatever, but don't follow that prescription to your tank and you know and it, if you do don't be surprised right that it maybe your your tank's not going to handle that the same way that's um, something we just i don't think has been part of the prescription for setting up a reef tank people don't have any guidelines past a few months right but it's like yeah okay at the one two year mark when your tank's filled in with corals then you can you know definitely up your fish population and feed them your fish should be getting larger by then um, I don't think there's much adjustment going on in the fish feeding department. Well, it's always funny, too, when um, people go on vacation and they feel like they have to have an auto feeder or a tank sitter come feed the fish every day. That's and an excellent I'll go on point. vacation for a week and, um, you know, maybe somebody comes in the middle of the week just to make sure everything's working as expected. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm like, hey, if you want to feed the fish, feed the fish. But they know how much to do, right? But, I mean, I've gone a whole week where nobody fed the tank and everything's fine. You know, I mean, That's a fish can handle a feast and a famine, you know. it's This like is why you are part of the show, man, because <coughs> these ideas are, are really important. Um, you know, I'm at the studio <coughs> every day, long hours, and... Some days I just don't feel like feeding the fish. I just don't <laughs> feel like it. You know, I'll beg, they beg, they beg. And you know what? I might feed them three, four times a day, a few days in a row. And then I might go just like, just no reason. I just might not feed them for a couple of days. You know, unless I got like little baby fish or a really small fish or something s- special. But, but yeah, definitely uh, when I'm leaving town, I'll just feed them pretty good before I leave. And I'll feed them really well when I get back. And one week is, is not even, doesn't even like cross my mind to have someone come and look after my babies. They have to feed every day. Unless you, unless you have delicate fish like Anthias or certain butterfly fish, that's the exception. Yeah, I, I could see, of course, you know, I, I don't want to make absolutes. There's, these are generalizations on your average reef tank, but I, you know, I've heard too many horror stories of an auto feeder or a tank sitter adding too much food and causing some kind of, you know, problem with the tank while the person's out of town. And I, I don't really hear, you don't really hear about bad things, you know, oh, nobody fed the fish for a week and I came home. Well, the fish were probably pretty hungry and pretty excited to see you, but everything was fine, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll take that approach over, you know, somebody coming in and maybe dumping a little too much in or the auto feeder is 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 not tuned properly or you know who knows that gives me you know i just had a great <clears throat> like um train of thought of something that i do kind of accidentally if um i know i'm coming up on a water change and i do water changes not to really change water per se but you know just to siphon out some detritus and siphon out a little bit of algae here and there or you know whatever is building up it fits with the ritual of, of being in tune with the tank um, I will actually go through periods where I will deliberately back off all the coral feeding, all the fish feeding, kind of let things clean up. Or if I'm getting coming up on our water change, I'll, I'll pulse it a little bit more. You know, or same thing if I'm looking at my corals and they're looking a little pale. I'll feed the fish and the corals a little bit more. And I'll probably overshoot. You know, it's, it's hard to get that exactly right. I don't test the nitrates or phosphates. I know they're there. Yeah. <laughs> but I know they're not too high because if I don't, you know, feed a... N- normally, not even aggressively, but if I don't feed normally for like a week, if I f- feed very lightly for a week, I, you know, I can see the the, the colors kind of pale up a little bit. Yeah, that. Well, I guess that segues into coral feeding. Uh, well, I just want to mention one analog. You know, definitely there's some certain crops that are popular around here in Colorado. You know, the c- common practice is to you know fertilize them until you you see a little bit of burn on the leaves, then flush them with fresh water and to get all the fertilizers out and then yeah. rinse and repeat and just do that over and over again. So I think um, definitely a pulsed approach to feeding and then letting the tank catch up with the nutrients. That's not even part of the discussion yet. Other, other than that, other than us two. 
That's true. I mean, and I like your water uh, change approach as well, because I've done that as well, where if I know I'm going to do a water change this coming Saturday, yep. you know, maybe Thursday or Friday, I'll go a little bit heavier on the feeding and, and, and throw some extra goodies in there. Just, you know, like that's that treat you're talking about, right? Um, because I know that I'm going to follow up with, you know, yeah. a siphon anyway. And um, clean some filter socks or whatever mechanical filter you have. Um, I do have a couple more things to say about fish feeding before we get oh more. Oh yeah, I've got more one more Until we too. focus on the, uh, <laughs> the coral nutrition side. Um, I got a big old slab of PE mysis the other day because the cube stuff is a lot smaller, but it's also a lot more expensive and it's kind of tedious, you know, because I have a lot of tanks to feed to pop them all out of the blisters. And sometimes if it's, you know, the freezer is really <laughs> cold, it's kind of hard to pop it out. But I literally put the slab of mysis on the ground and took a hammer and broke it up into a bunch of little chunks and then put that into a Tupperware because, man, that's, but that's part of the, the laziness of being a reefer. It's like, man, I don't want to get in there and, like, uh, on a dime. I don't want to break up a piece of mysis, you know, with force and then get that, that oil on your hands that you will smell for hours. And then, you know, you really should be rinsing PE mysis. That is such rich food. You want to thaw it out and then rinse it like straight tap water. <laughs> Not too hot. You don't want to cook it. Um, but get some of that juice off. Get that, that oil off that's just going to go everywhere almost instantly and just collapse your skimmer for days, you know, depending on how much you get in there. Yeah, I, I usually take those flat packs like the LRS stuff and I'll um, I'll just put it on a cutting board and I'll cut it into cubes and then Same just idea. stick it in a Tupperware. So Because every time I would try to break See, I didn't a even chunk know you did off, that. Yeah. I didn't even know you did that. <laughs> well, I mean, That's so funny. We both like uh, gravitated towards the same little little hack to speed things up when we do want to feed frozen food. Right. Well, if you notice with the flat packs, it's like you go in with an intended size you want to break <laughs> off. And you always end up with either a really tiny one or a really big one. And always. then with the really big one, you're kind of like, well, I guess I'm overfeeding today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's so funny that you do that. But yeah, those blister packs, I mean, they cost money to, to, to put in through a machine and they're lower value and yeah just get the flat packs and just go ahead and cut them up or break them up yourself yeah. i would have done the cutter board thing but i got like a big 32 ounce uh flat pack of my so i think i'm good for a couple <laughs> couple Dang. years um but yeah i, I want to give a little bit more to the prepare uh, love to the prepared foods you know flake is my every day but when i well, but for the fish tank um particularly that field i feed pellets in there and when I get a new fish that you know maybe has a record of being finicky, um, certain velvet angelfish or regal angelfish or certain apelomictus angelfish, once I see them eating flake or pellets, I'm like, oh, you're home free now. Mm -hmm. Because if you only eat frozen food, there's a certain pickiness there that you know it's just not going to be great for the fish if it only eats mice or only eats brine. You know that that's a you know has a limited nutritional profile. But if you get that those man, those pellets are like. Fish food is hyper engineered. Let's oh just yeah. let's just let's Look just give the a, a moment there. Yeah, the ingredients are freaking crazy, and all of that knowledge came from aquaculture, mm -hmm. right? And then also like koi. So there's a lot of science that's gone into those things. Obviously, there's a lot of fillers and there's a lot of ways to do it cheap. Um, but you have some great experience with it, with feeding ex almost exclusively pelleted food, right? Yeah, and that's that's the challenge that when when somebody goes out there and you know if they want to give me crap about <clears throat> being a pellet feeder and not you know using cellcon and and frozen food it's like show me show me where like give me evidence that the fish i have had are malnourished right or mm -hmm. like like point to me i mean the coloration's great no lateral line or hole in the head type issues um they're fat you know I don't like fish to be fat, right? That goes back to your, your comment earlier about uh, overfeeding a bit. Um, but they look great. Um, and that includes uh, tangs, angels. I, I mean, I've kept it all. Um, you know, I'm not a big fish breeder, but uh, Bangai cardinals that I've kept produce babies. And uh, usually down in my Calerpa sump, there's a bunch of babies swimming around. Um, my clownfish periodically spawn. So I'm looking for the evidence of, well, Tell me, you know, point out what's wrong with my fish and why I should, you know, add more more waste to my tank that I now have to deal with. Yeah, um, no, that's that's a great um, 
way to look at it that's really going to come in handy when we switch over to talking about the coral food is show me the evidence. Right. You know, if you want some examples of what fat, obese fish look like, think about the public aquarium displays that you've seen where, you know, what's supposed to be kind of a flattish, you know, rounded, still kind of thick surgeon fish is almost like a torpedo. Right, they're almost like cylindrical. Then some of the other, like a, a you know, trigger fish or like, like a round football, and you might think that's normal. But when you go diving on the reef, that's not how it is. Sure, you know they're thick and they're they're they've got healthy body weight. But yeah, public aquariums, you know they have especially if they have a huge exhibit and they've got a thousand or five thousand fish to feed. They have to put like an insane amount of food in there, and not all the fish are eating at the same rate and so you definitely have the more aggressive feeders just every single day twice a day getting more than their fair share and they just get fat man they get so fat that their eyes pop out this is something you really see with some of the oldest overfed fish like they get so fat that there's no room for their eyes in their eye sockets and the eyes pop out like they don't explode out they're just literally kind of bug-eyed it's you know the a funny experience i've had recently having this discussion was um a friend of mine you know we we discussed intermittent fasting which i've tinkered with and uh this person's like a big believer in intermittent fasting for you know their own personal health and Mm -hmm. weight loss and all that fun stuff um and you know they're always tweaking their diet and they're looking at like paleo and all this other stuff but then it's funny because they also have a saltwater aquarium and the way they feed their fish is just chunks and chunks of frozen food and um how does that not carry over if they're so militant about their own diet that they're doing the opposite with their fish? It made me kind of think, I mean, I'm not saying a human and a fish are, you know, there's obviously the huge differences in, in, in that area, but, um, and so, you know, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize how you take care of fish, but it just was interesting, you know, like, you know, we're coming to the point where we're just, you know, like there's a lot of science behind the human body tends to do better with a bit of feast and a bit of famine, right? Like, like the, the reason your body packs on pounds when you eat too many calories is it's pre- prepping for that famine, right? But yeah. when there is never a famine, then you become a, a hoarder of this stuff that you don't really need. And so I, I, I I'm not a, ichthyologist but i just wonder about that you know when you're throwing fatty mice shrimp in that tank and all this other fun stuff and you're battling the 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 nutrients that come with it and and you're saying like you you see these obese fish sometimes at public aquaria like is that really the best way or is it better to have uh thinner fish right i mean it's i I, you know i no i think what you're saying is kind of dovetailing what i was talking about with my kind of my pulsed approach to nutrients same thing with the corals i don't feed them any i don't do anything all the the same way all the time right when it comes to feeding obviously when it comes to mineral replenishment it's pretty much all the same um but i don't do any one thing you know one week i'm more motivated i might feed the corals three times a week and uh, the next week I might just totally blow it over, you know, because those cor- corals are not, they're not out of nutrients, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're not going to drop dead if I don't feed them that exact day. Um, but yeah, I, one of the things that is a little bit unfortunate is when I work at aquarium stores, uh, you've seen these like big, you know, uh, glass door freezers at, oh, yeah. at fish stores. They'll have one, two, four. There's a good reason for that. Frozen food is was such a reliable money maker, man. We would make a thousand, like a smaller fish store, a thousand dollars a week in profit on frozen food. So, I'm not saying every store does that. Some stores do more. Um, and then you know you, you throw in some uh, some high high density uh, reef nutrition and. What's the incentive for the fish store to tell their customers to feed less? Right. Who's yeah. going to do that? Right? Because if they feed more, then they'll have algae problems. So they'll do more water changes and they'll buy more salt. And then they'll get some cleanup crew to eat some algae. And then they'll get a media reactor to, to use some GFO or some bio pellets. And they'll come back every week or every month to refill those reactors. There's this weird, wicked loop there. And again, I'm not saying it's intentional, but if you're a fish store owner, you don't really necessarily want to tell your customers, hey, you can solve your problem or 75% of your algae issues if you just fed less. 
it's the same as humans, right? Uh, there's always these fads, but the one that is uh, the best solution is just don't eat as much. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat as much, eat sensibly, and walk around sometimes. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think uh, you know we've covered a lot about the the, the fish food. Um, I know that. I get weird looks when I tell people like I'm primarily a flig feeder and um, I've used a lot of different ones. Omega C is pretty good. Uh, P mysis is really good too, but I just find the bottom of that jar like way too soon. It's just not uh, economical. And um, a lot of flake foods have a lot of dust at the end of the jar and it's so annoying. Um, but I just want to put a little shout out there for uh, what is it called? CS Pro. Um, I think it's called is by Aqualife or something, but they hand pack this flake specifically to avoid um, having all that dust at the bottom of the jars. I was talking to them. I was like, "How is it that I get to the bottom of the jar of CS Pro?" And that stands for Calanus Spirulina Pro. Um, so you've got your meat with the you know and the astaxanthin color enhancing pigment from the copepods, and then you've got all the benefits of spirulina in one flake. I was like, "How is it that I get to the bottom of a jar?" And there's like there's almost no dust and then all the flakes are kind of chunky. Like I can pull out one big flake and feed it, you know, directly to um, some of my fish that at the surface. You can't do that with other foods. And they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't use a machine to pack our jars. We do it by hand. It takes a long time and I'm in love with this food. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, really I, read your, I just knew uh, that people were going to ask. I read your, your, your article on them and uh, you had me at the end of the article. I ordered some. And I opened it up, and I was shocked at the size of the flakes. They're like, they're huge. Well, um, so the thing is, you can take big flakes and break them off. You can make the, them the other size thing is, down, yeah. The thing that also super streamline, or streamlines my flake feeding process is I have a pair of tongs. You know, just kind of long tweezers with a little bit of a rubber tip. I think I got reptile ones because they were like a fraction of the price of smaller ones. And I wanted to see if the stainless steel would hold up. And yeah, sure enough, $5 tongs. Because, you know, you, with the flake food, you want to kind of dip it in the water so it doesn't go everywhere. But I love how it stays in suspension. It's every size you could think of. So it can feed the small fish. The lo even a small fish can shove a big flake in its oh, mouth. Yeah. Um, used to, I don't know, when I was coming up, there was definitely this fear that, oh, the flake form factor would just you know dissolve its nutrition into the water i'm like man if you saw my f fish eat there's no flakes left in like 30 seconds <laughs> so also you know if you want to dabble in some flake feeding definitely a pair of tongs will help uh, speed up the process and you know that you don't want to get that water and flake food mixture on your fingertips that's not that's not pimping <laughs> i just uh, yeah I, I put it in my tank and and usually w with flake um Anytime I've tried something new, uh, fish have always been real slow to adopt. Eventually, they will. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I th the the curious thing about this stuff is, I added it, and um, the f they just went right for it, which I, I, that was encouraging to me because I have a few finicky fish. But uh, yeah, I just throw it into my feeding ring, and you're right; it kind of sits there for a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, my hawkfish is he's the punk, and he'll go up into the feeding ring and just go nuts, and that causes the that causes enough disruption for the rest of them to go into the water, but yeah, I don't. You know, I'm um, not trying to plug CS Pro per no, se. No, uh, but I'm it's a just good product. promoting I'll give you that. what a good quality flake can be like. Because man, there are some crumbly, really wafer thin kind of flakes that I wouldn't want to eat. <laughs> you know, you yeah. put them in the water and it just kind of looks like tissue. And some very some fish who are very aggressive eaters will look at it and be like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I, look, man, I'm not sponsored by any fish food, but that stuff was good. And, and then my, my go-to will always be New Life Spectrum. I've been using that since the dawn of time. And, you know, it's, it's my pellet. I don't know. I've tried other stuff, but that stuff I just works. I have grown some serious fish with New Life Spectrum. Like, no joke, my old flamingo tang, I mean, I grew them from you know, tiny one inch Jesus fish to like a 10 inch monster eating almost exclusively that and just increase the size, increase the size, incre oh, the pellets, you know, just increase the pellet size as they can handle it. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've been using new life spectrum for a long time. Yeah, I swear by them. I've used them for freshwater, saltwater. Um, yeah. Pablo Taput has a you know, serious background in history in the reef aquarium hobby. 
Um, so, and, and that food's been around for a long time. I think African cichlid people have some of the biggest challenges when it comes to really bringing out all the colors of their fish. Um, only second only to saltwater fish and uh, you know African cichlid breeders and champion breeders you know they swear by that stuff I'm always scared at that they'll somehow change the recipe on that it's kind of like when you find a, a pair of shoes running shoes that you really like mm. and then and then you know the next iteration of the shoe is terrible and you're like man I should have bought like 25 pairs of that like New life has been so good, and then I see them adding probiotics and some other stuff. And so far, you know, even those uh, varieties, my fish have liked. But I'm always like, oh man, you know, don't don't change it. Everything's good about it. But I can understand that, you know, they they're trying to to try new things and 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 make it better. Well, it's it's oh god, it's kind of unfortunate, <clears throat> you know. I, mean, I think you and I can both agree that probiotics are total sham. All of the science is done on one single strain of one species called Lactobacillus. And like we know probiotics are a thing for sure in your food, in your environment, but you, in fresh foods, you know, and but this Lactobacillus culture that they put, you know, this, this powder on there is just like this, you know, that's not doing anything. But if you're looking at a shelf full of fish food and all the fish food has probiotics and this one doesn't, then what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Man, I love how we're like 15 minutes into this session, and we're just now starting to talk about coral food. <laughs> yeah. What's your What's your general stance on, I guess, coral food, coral feeding, and nutrition? Well, um, I get that corals have mouths, mm -hmm. so they like to eat something, um, and um, I, you know, I do think obviously because of that it is beneficial to corals, but um, I, I've tinkered with it. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried different products, and uh, eventually it goes to the wayside like frozen food does, and I start to neglect doing it. And I really don't experience much of a benefit, uh, maybe because I've never done it consistently, but. Um, what I do know is I'm able to grow the corals I want to grow mm -hmm. um, without feeding a coral food to my tank. So um, it's not necessary for me to have a beautiful reef tank with healthy corals. Uh, it's not a necessary requirement for me to feed the tank coral food, um, at least in my experience. So, you know, again it's another nutrient source why why would i bother with it i mean i've tried i've 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 had fun with it you know i mean especially like lps are fun to feed right and enemies so are fun. fun to feed but then you get into like sps then you get into uh, gorgonians and some of these smaller polyp stuff and you know i go in there with my little pipette and try different particle size foods and all this stuff um i i don't know i just um i I don't really see much of a benefit. It's hard for me to calculate an incre increase in growth rate or coloration, perhaps, because I do run a somewhat nutrient-rich tank. I'm not, uh, I don't run like an ultra-low nutrient system, right? Even when I was in the SPS, I, I, you would consider my tank fairly dirty compared to like what, how crazy people go with um, keeping their nutrients down. So maybe if your tank is just super starved of phosphates and nitrates, right? I do believe that, um, and I've read some articles that seem to support the idea that some of the coral feeding is really there uh, to introduce the necessary nutrients for the zoo zanthelli, right? Yeah. It's a way, it's a mechanism for bringing in, in in a phosphate or or um, nit nitrogenous waste, and I say it like that because I'm I, I'm at the moment like I, I don't quite remember like if it's amo ammonia or like nitrates there's they're in that zoo zan zoo prefer but um you know either way um again going back to the real reef analogy the water may be so poor in those elements that the only way to provide that for the zoo zan is by ingesting bacteria and and small particles of food that have those building blocks right so I get that maybe in a very nutrient poor system, coral feeding could show huge benefits, right? So somebody might be listening to this and think I'm crazy, but I just have never really seen a need to do it. So you don't deliberately, deliberately feed your corals. 
No. And then I have my entire recipe with like every piece of <laughs> food in the market that I feed, you know, a few times a week at night. So, so those great um, points of view on it comes to feeding. I think we can both agree, though, that corals need those zooxanthellae within the corals needs the nutrients, however that's delivered, to in order to photosynthesize. Right? They're not. Yeah. The you know every plant needs nitrogen, and they need phosphorus. And this is a great time to point out that if a coral food says it's phosphate free, that's not food. You right. have to have phosphate in the food for it to be food and nutritious. Um, but I guess kind of along those same lines, ma'am, I don't think corals really care what you feed them as long as it's got the nutrients and as long as they can get it in their mouth, right? So I care I agree. Mo a lot I, more I about particle size than I do of like feeding one of everything. Yeah, I mean, with fish, you know, you have obligate coralivores, you have, you have things that were evolved to eat specific things. I think in the in the realm of corals, you know, where everybody's like, oh, I wonder what its natural prey is. I'm like, I don't think it cares, right? I think it's similar to carnivorous plants, right? I mean, they evolved to grow in very nutrient poor situations and they have, you know, like uh, the Venus flytrap and pitcher plants. The whole reason is they're not, it's not like they're eating it and they have a stomach and they, they're using it to get the building blocks that the that allow them to continue with photosynthesis right they just they straight need the fertilizer you yeah know, we're, the we're fertilizer that's the word i'm looking for we're just on the cusp of making some um, big growth moves here at the reef builder studio and i really want to do some studies you know and do one tank that's kind of nutrient poor and then do one tank where i literally only add nitrate and small amounts of phosphates and another tank where i actually feed to reach those same levels and i suspect that just having the nitrate and phosphorus in your water will probably get you like 80% of the way in terms of just general coral growth, health, and vitality. I think the only caveat to all of this is just like fish feeding, right? If you're trying to condition fish to breed, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, hit them with all the food that they need to make great sperm and eggs. You know, Jamie Craggs has definitely demonstrated that uh, feeding a lot is one of the biggest ways you can condition corals to create their egg and sperm bundles. They just can't, they don't, how, they don't have enough energy or building blocks purely from photosynthesis and what's in the water. Um, and like you said, you know, when you go diving and you see all the polyps open at, at night, when, you know, if it's a night titan dive and you shine your light on, on different corals, man, they will, every kind of coral will, will catch like bristle worms and just giant pods and even tiny little fish swimming in the water. They're, they don't really care as long as they can digest it. You know, and this is a, another point I want to bring up is uh, corals have very simple digestive systems, right? So like I've seen people really packing like big old pellets into their LPS or scolies, you know, it's fun. It looks cool, but the homeboy doesn't have any way to chew that up. You know, so that's one thing I do with some of the larger pelleted foods. There's been a lot more kind of really high priced cold extruded foods uh, for feeding anemones and for uh, LPS. The first thing I do, man, is I take those and I just drop them in some like a little thing of water just to see if they'll first of they'll dissolve because if they don't dissolve, then that coral is just going to spit it back out. You know, it'll suck some juice off the outside and uh, just spit it back out. But that's why I feed a, a super wide range of, of coral foods. Um, then I, you know, I really enjoy target feeding my uh, Duncans and Elegance and Bubbles and anemones. But I have giant anemone pellets. I've stopped giving those to my anemones. I save those for my trigger fish. And I'd rather give the anemone like a bigger pinch of finer particles that I know are going to dissolve when it gets inside its gut. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, uh, there's definitely, you know, and then the other thing is you, what you were saying about the, the show me principle, you know, I've always kind of judged reef tanks um, based on what I can see, right? If I walk up to a tank, you can kind of tell if they feed a lot or if their alkalinity is up or if they're dosing amino acids or if they have enough flow, if they have enough light. But man, you ain't never walked up on a tank and said, ooh, this tank looks like it has a lot of phytoplankton, let alone multiple types of phytoplankton. And in the, if sure, if you're, if you're feeding uh, uh, non-photosynthetic uh, gorgonians or sponges or really want to get tricky with it, sure, go ahead and make your, your whole tank a you know, nice green water soup once in a while. But uh, we need more documentation 
and more evidence of certain foods actually having a general effect <laughs> on the well-being of our corals. Well, I, it's I, I would I would definitely love to see more experimentation, right? You it like does calcification, right? Like your alk consumption also in your tank change with feeding. I mean, you could do a lot of cool experiments. I just don't have the time basic to do that. Experiments, right? Yeah. I know, you know. I wouldn't call you a casual hobbyist, but I, this is where you know, I'm over yeah. here creating the content. So we're going to come up with some ideas on how to do this stuff. Um, but, but yeah, you really, the other thing is when it comes to all these things you should be doing for your fish and your corals, right? High light, high flow, dose this, dose that. That should be the purview of the coral farmers or the coral breeders, you know, who are doing research and stuff. Or you know certain exhibits that right now are trying to rescue some uh, Caribbean stony corals, but if you have a casual laid-back reef tank, don't even worry about it, man. If you just want some pretty animals to look yeah. at, don't worry about it. These are kind of like the fringe things. It's it's no different from having you know a very basic uh, laptop that will just you know open your email or whatever and do some web browsing versus you know some dedicated like a lot more RAM and, and a graphics card and a huge power supply and, and a high resolution screen. Uh, unless you're trying to take your corals to the max, you shouldn't be worried about all these tiny little details that we know have a benefit, but they also have some, some side effects if you don't do it right. Yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head right there is, if I was a coral farmer and I'm, I'm okay with some diminishing returns, right? I'm okay with pushing it to that edge of maximizing the things that I'm looking for in terms of growth and coloration, then yeah, I get it. But um, it's, I've not, with my casual observation, seen my, uh, uh, I've not experienced a failure to thrive in my corals or fish by keeping my feeding fairly simple and straightforward when it comes to fish and also not really feeding my corals right i mean mm -hmm. they get fed i mean there's you know there's a, there's there's things in my tank that feed my corals obviously right but um i've not seen a failure to thrive so for me tweaking out that little bit of extra by feeding the tank you know coral food i think is more there's more negatives to potentially doing that than the positives and i in my opinion if you're going and looking at a bunch of instagram home pretty tanks i don't think you could tell the difference between who does coral feeding and who does not except and for if they're they making feed. feeding this videos powered by <laughs> right i i i mean i don't mean to discredit coral food or anybody that makes it i just don't think it's a necessary element to have a good looking reef tank that i don't, that I don't know if this necessary is the word i would use but maybe like obligatory right? that's yeah yeah you know you're definitely gonna have some more growth and a little bit more vitality but do you really have to no you know we did this for a long time without it and i don't think there's a nearly enough discussion or consideration of the role of fish poop as a source mm -hmm. of coral food you know man you go diving you see all these little particles in the water if there's fish that are evolved to eat the poop of other zooplanktivores that you know so first of all fish poop is essentially like partially digested bacteria coated nuggets of nutrition <laughs> they're not they're not like the manure that you think of, which is just fibrous and just junky, you know, you're talking about, you know, if a high metabolism anthias eats, uh, you know, some very high, nu highly nutritious zooplankton, it's not going to just extract every bit of nutrition out of it just instantly. And that's why there's certain fish that are adapted to eating the, f the poop, the fecal matter from zooplanktivorous fish. And that food rains on the reef tank. It all day long, you know, and I'm wondering if that might be the missing link to certain non photosynthetic stony corals or soft corals um, that we're into. But let me tell you about one anecdote. Um, uh, when was it? I guess it was probably about this time last year that the HANA like low range nitrate checker came out and all my corals looked fine. You know, they weren't growing crazy. You know, definitely some of the LPS um, had kind of stagnated. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that Christmas Favia I mentioned a couple episodes back. And um, I tested the nitrates on one system. It was 0, 0.00. 0. 
another system was 0.05, and the one that was just visually doing the best was 0.17. And I started feeding a lot more, but in one tank, even though I was I had already ramped up my feeding, I went from two surgeon fish and I pulled out one, not trouble fish, but a fish who just didn't belong in that tank, and I added like six more surgeon fish, so I went from two to eight. Then I was feeding a little bit, but man, within like a week or two, I noticed a polyp extension, especially on the acros that were you know resting on the ground. They got crazy polyp extension, and I was looking at them like, this is not just from feeding. You know, I can just imagine those those tang you know, worms, those little pellets, just riding along the ground, just kind of breaking up and just constantly raining into the polyps of um, with the acros sitting on the ground. Um, so yeah, that's my thing. I think there's not just the fish waste, you know, that just goes straight into water, but actual fecal matter uh, landing in corals, you know, after it hits a power head and gets exploded into a bunch of tiny pieces. It's coated in bacteria, man. There's got to be some nutritious nuggets, but I don't think there's a real practical way to test that out you know, on, on the reef. No, yeah, I mean, that goes back to uh, when people are... Do I mean, I, I, I take her with dosing nitrates when I bottomed out in my tank, which was odd considering um, how I run my tank. But I, you and I talked about it, and it, I started dosing nitrates, and I did see uh, a marked improvement in some of my corals and just in terms of um, – especially because I keep a lot of soft corals, right? It's like they swelled up more like balloon-like yeah. and stuff, and, and I thought that was kind of interesting. They were like – putting more water inside of them, I guess, in a way. Um, but but that got me thinking, you know, I'm not going to sit here and dose nitrates, right? I'm going to add more fish, right? But, uh, <laughs> add more fish or feed, you, feed your fish a little bit more. But yeah, right when but I it was got me thinking about your, your waste and, uh, pro, you know, that as well of like maybe that's also, uh, maybe that was a beneficial add as well in terms of adding that bio load. You're, you're creating essentially uh, a, um, a coral food source, right? Yeah. Um, it's just, this is a challenging topic, right? Because we're coming at it from the food feeding the fish, the waste of the fish. There's also the the, you know, the waste that goes straight into the water from the fish versus the fecal matter versus the nutrients versus we're not even, we're not even going to scratch dissolved organic carbon that's just in the water uh, versus feeding the corals and then you know directly taking some nutrition from there. That's that's a tough one, man. And I, I definitely you you know what I'd like to see. Um, what I was saying is it's so easy to take some ingredients and just grind them up into a powder and call it a coral food, but almost no one has done any actual feeding trials of food A versus food B and or versus just dosing nitrates. And I feel like, um, you know, these these food companies and, you, you, you know, there's a few of them out there. Their whole entire brand is is made around this, like, it's not enough to just give your food to somebody and say, hey, the corals look great. It's like, man, let's let's see some experiments. Like, let's, let's mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, for example, like the, the, the feeding recommendations on your fish food jar says, oh, feed as much as your fish can eat in three or four minutes. Dude, my fish will be dead if I fed them for three to four <laughs> minutes straight. They would just explode, right? So there just, there just needs to be a lot more demonstration of results of, of what you can expect. And man, I still think it just, you know, I'm glad that you and I are really on opposite ends of the spectrum for this because if you're a casual reefer and you just want to have a pretty reef tank and you actually want your corals to grow slowly because you don't want to frag them up because you don't want to keep up with all this, the mineral demands and you don't have to feed your tank. You don't have to just feed your fish a little bit more and you'll be fine. If you're a coral farmer now and you need, you know, as many polyps off your Krakatoa zoanthids at three hundred dollars per single polyp like yeah of course you know turbocharge your feeding um but i just i don't think newbies or newer reef keepers should be giving that much consideration until they've you know been at it for like six months to a year and they want to like hit that next level so an another thing i wanted to say about all these um this whole food market, right, is, um, and you, you touched upon it, like, oh, well, now I gotta go buy snails because I got this problem, right, is uh, at the fish store. Um, 
One is by not subscribing to all of this crazy overfeeding of fish and, and then well, in, in the area of coral, really not feeding them at all. Um, I've, I've always felt a disconnect with this obsession with mechanical filtration, but I always wondered, well, maybe it's because I don't really feed a whole lot, right? So, and then the other part is, um, you know, because I see these filter rollers and everybody's doing filter oh, socks. Oh, no, you're going to have one on your tank, man. I'm going to talk you into it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, so there's this war on detritus, right? And uh, in my opinion, I, I don't, again, I think of talking about misconceptions last time, my personal opinion is I don't know why is everybody everybody's so scared of detritus. And um, if you want to feed your corals, I mean, that detrital mome, there's a whole ecosystem that 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 uh, functions around that. And and so it's just funny, like, you know, people are putting all this microscopic food into their tanks and then they're obsessed with how much detritus is building up in their sump or, uh, you know, I don't know. It just cracks me up because it's kind me, of funny to see people injecting a ton of particular food into the tank, but then having very aggressive protein skimmers and yeah. very aggressive filter rolls just to feed it all over again. And when I recognized that I had a very low nutrition Nutri nutrient situation in some of my reef tanks um, on the system that was 0 0.00. I started feeding more. I started feeding the fish more. I turned down the skimmers, but I had one just skimmer, one of the more aggressive ones, literally just coming on for six hours a day. You know, because I'm like, oh, I need, I literally need to get the nutrients up. But it's kind of a delicate balancing act. But the reason I like filter rolls is, you know me, I like my uh, reduced ecology reef tank. I'm the original negative space aquascaper over here. Um, but the reason for me it is to reduce the maintenance yeah. uh, required on everything. But mostly like your protein skimmer and your return pump, right? I don't want that mom that detritus to build up in there. There's other ways to kind of collect it with a, like a settling chamber and stuff. And um, But yeah, I guess that brings up another point. People being really worried about certain types of devices in your aquarium killing natural plankton in your aquarium. It's like, first of all, you don't have anything close to the ocean. Right. And second of all, there's nothing you can do that is going to decimate whatever traces of phyto and zooplankton that occur in your aquarium shy of having a very high powered ultraviolet sterilizer. Well, I, you know, and I get that the high import, high export, right? Feed heavy, and then have a filter roller or filter sock, some kind of mechanical filtration for, mm -hmm. I, I get that approach, but uh, I just, I don't, I feel like the, I feel like there's some value in detritus in terms of food, you know. Um, there detritus, you mean leftover fish poop, like I was just talking about, that's coated in bacteria and exactly. all kinds of little buggers are eating it. I think this is a good time to point out that my, my feeding philosophy very much got recalibrated last fall when I went to Worldwide Coral's Superstore because I saw their store one year apart. I saw how much they were feeding, how just luscious every coral was, and how they had very nice protein skimmers on every system, and they were all off. <laughs> they were all off. And I was asking them, it's like, um, I, I know there's a, a few other reefers who are coming to this conclusion or these realizations that when you have a big standing crop of coral, it becomes the filter, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have a protein skimmer, you're basically just competing with your corals. You know, so a farm like Worldwide Corals, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're really trying to grow corals. When you have a, a lot of corals in the tank, they will be your nutrient export mechanism. Yeah, I mean... Um so I you uh, have large corals in your tank too, right? And so they're probably helping with that. Well, because that's what you know. soft corals are easy, right? They'll take over a tank in no time, and then you've got a lot of coral biomass. I, I equ always equate it to, like, in the planted hobby, you plant your fast-growing plants yep, first to yep. just get uh, a stronghold on any get algae your issues. Your and your hornwort and your yeah. hydrophila up in there real fast. So, I mean, again, don't. I, I've kept SPS dominant tanks and all that stuff. I, I just like the softy tanks now. Um, and I, I mean, I still have Acropore and all that in there. It's a mixed reef. But um, no, uh, what I was going to say is, you know, when I did that aquabiomics uh, test, he noted that uh, my nitrite fixing bacteria were so low that they didn't register. And, and he even attributed, he's like, look, I've seen pictures of your tank. You've got a pretty good coral biomass, right? So. There's a there's plenty of competition for those nutrients, but um, 
the other thing, you know, I remember um, an old picture of Peter Wilkins, and he was keeping uh, some of those semi, I call them semi-photosynthetic, it's probably not the right word for him, but like those stereo nephthias and stuff that are, mm-hmm. you know, can definitely benefit from, I think, feeding more than, say, like a, you know, your your te- your typical soft coral, but... Um, and there was just a picture of him stirring his sand bed with a stick, and then he's like, "That's how I feed." You know, that's how that he was doing that to to feed those corals uh, is at least what was depicted in the picture. But I always thought that was kind of interesting. It, again, goes back to your idea of you know some of that fish waste and all of that is 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 it's the right it's a good particulate size. I don't know if it's the right size, but um, there's there's a lot of uh, of of um, man. What was the word you used? Um, a lot of the, the the fertilizer that that coral wants to ingest to feed the zooxanthellae in there, right? The funny thing is, man, you know, like plenty of our people listening or watching right now, they've already got the balance. They've already got it like locked in with the balance between their fish or their mm-hmm. detritus and their nutrient export and how much they're feeding their fish or if they're feeding the coral and then the coral population. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who just have it dialed in. And then if, you know, if they go online or if they go to the fish store and they're told they need to start feeding some coral food, throw it all out of whack. <laughs> I would say, you know, once again, um, use sense, uh, uh, use, use some common sense and some observation to determine if that's, that's the right thing for you right you know me man i want like the most luscious coral specimens possible but that being said i don't ever throw coral food in the nano aquarium it's got a giant you know australian gold torch uh hammer coral bunch of green star polyps i'm about and a couple soft corals in there but i don't want those to grow any faster right because if they grow any faster then i have to take start taking stuff out so it's really like what are you trying to achieve if you're not feeding your reef tank you're not necessarily you're not doing it wrong you know, but if you want to propagate and if you want to, you know, spawn corals, then that's something you should really look at, right? But I don't think that's the kind of nuance that's being uh, brought into the conversation when it comes to uh, coral, general coral nutrition, um, but that should be. You know, no, no reef store is like, well, if you want to grow your corals faster, then you should feed this. They'll say, yeah, your corals need to be fed by this, you know, every few weeks. <laughs> And it's not, it's not vicious. It's not evil. It's just kind of natural. You know when all the coral food started to come out? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when you started to see it for sale and you had like reef frenzy and you had all these, the, um, they, they all sort of jumped on the scene around the same time. At least it felt like the same time for me. It was probably like 10 years. But um, I, I got excited because I thought we were – jumping into an era like i thought oh you know what we're about to figure out how to keep the non-photosynthetic stuff we're about to uh see some significant leapfrog in in you know progress in the hobby right like that like i can sit there and think about all these momentous things that changed the hobby for the better right so i got super excited and i'm not trying to be a negative nancy but it's been a while and i haven't seen i mean no you're totally freaking right you're totally right you know making a coral food is a a low stakes product right you're not going to add so much coral food that you kill your tank in one day you know you might develop some nutrients down the road um but it's just an easy thing to just take some fish meal and some krill meal and grind it up and say oh look at my dust it's coral food now (laughs) <laughs> you know, and so there's just like there's very low stakes and very low risk, and um, the same with you, man. I'm I'm still trying. I have a NPS tank. I got a few more NPS today, um, experimenting with them, and I I actually don't think it's anything special. I don't think dendronephias need anything special. It's just the super challenging of uh, the the challenge of pumping so much food into them, but also getting rid of the nutrients. Um, at the same time, I don't. There's nothing magical about what they eat, and it's so strange that, you know, when you go diving, past a certain depth, every coral is non-photosynthetic all of a sudden. You know, yeah. you see huge fields of carnations and beautiful, just absolutely gorgeous gorgonians, man. Holy crap! And they don't need any light. You know, you do. You do want just enough light to show off their colors, so you wouldn't need an expensive light. Um, but I have 
Oh man, I've, this is like my fourth NPS tank. I wouldn't say any of them has ever thrived. Like I've kept a lot of different things for a long time, but I've never started sharing frags of dendronetheos, uh, you know, or blueberry gargonians. I never got that far. Um, the NPS stonies are super easy, obviously, but they grow all in kind of slow. Um, but yeah, we're we're like missing half of the catalog of yeah. of corals out in the ocean um, in our highly lit tropical you know sun sunlight acropora <laughs> reef tanks you know what i'm saying yeah i mean there, i remember there was a time where we thought the problem with goniopera was food right uh when when we had trouble keeping them alive and now they're fairly easy to keep and yeah now I is don't that know because we happened. started feeding i don't think so i kept the goniopera it butted off a a little baby coral well, there was you know, the red the yeah red. it was the easier long but still i mean all of a sudden dude i have a bunch of gonies and I would buy Bonnie Gani frags because I couldn't resist that color. Just thinking in the back of my head, oh yeah, for sure, this is this is gonna be a skeleton in three to six months. You know, it'll get stung a little bit. And um, to be honest, like I, my only hypothesis for why we're being able, we're able to grow flower pots now is because of the fragging. I think because of the fragging, we're getting a bunch of funk because they have a really soft, poor skeleton, and a lot of stuff grows in there. Um, that being said, I do have a few colonies that are doing just fine mm -hmm. and I'm not doing anything different that I did way back in the day. So I'm not sure what happened there, I, but yeah, I, that was one of those I of thought it. was, uh, oh, we're going to unlock the secret to this coral with food when we figure out what the right, you know, thing the is feeding and, could oh. increase your chances, right? It could just tip the balance when it comes to things like, uh, Ganyaporos flower pots, or as you like to say, gondioperas, um, they might just tip the balance between the coral thriving and the coral not thriving. And so that's, that's the thing I just, uh, the message I really want to get across with uh, coral feeding in particular, like, you know, fish nutrition, we have our opinions on that, and people either feed too much or, the, or they feed a normal amount. But when it comes to coral food, man, there's a lot of nuance right there. There's sure. A lot oh, of yeah, no doubt. Like I said, if I was, if I was a coral farmer or... I just enjoyed feeding corals. I mean, um, I enjoyed you know, feeding corals. <laughs> yeah, um, I just, I didn't. I, I guess my point was that I, I haven't seen a need to do it in order for my corals to thrive, and so I'm not gonna do it really. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll no, I'm no. sure, I'm sure I'll tinker with it again. Uh, but you know what I like about coral feeding the most? I love how we're just not talking about any specifics on coral feeding like this food or this particle size or this ingredients we're just talking about the bigger picture what i love about coral feeding is getting the shaggiest acropora polyps possible i don't think you can get those super shaggy polyps you know without feeding you could probably get it with like feeding your fish so there's some particles in there and some detritus in there and make sure that you have some nutrients in there but man when i feed the acros in particular they just start getting shaggy and they, they grow faster but i'm trying to grow corals for all the tanks and it's fun yeah. you know and this is what we're doing here at the refilter studio but the, i would never i would never prescribe to a casual aquarius who really loves their corals but it doesn't want to do so much to it, I would never tell them, oh, you have to start feeding your tank. You know, and that's the kind of information that gets uh, rammed down people's throats in forums, in groups, uh, in reef shows, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's wrong to do it. Like I said, they got mouths, but uh, I, to your point, you know, I, you're, you're, if you're, if you're chasing, if you know, like you said, uh, most people listening probably have a good balance going. They've they've got they things probably wired or there. tuned in. They're probably already there. I just want to yeah. kind of pepper them with some some consideration for what they are already doing. And if you want to achieve different levels of success, you know, here you go. Here's a few tools. Um, but yeah, I really love where this discussion went because like. I could totally see us just like dissecting apart different types of phytoplankton and zooplankton and dissolved organic matter and like all these little things. And then I think philosophically, I don't think the corals care whether either eating reefroids or brightwell. I don't think the coral has a preference. If it's a nutritious morsel of food, they don't have those same tribes and camps. Um, that some of the you know the reefer associations might have. Agree, yeah, I fully agree. 
it's very it's cool. It's probably more size driven than than you know anything. And nutrition, right? You, yeah. you can't just you know if you take some of this like krill meal, a lot of that's just going to be chitinous shell. Sure, the coral might like ingest it, but there's not going to get that much nutrient nutrition from it. So, um, yeah, I think there's still a lot more to be done. But man, I really think the f- the f- every food manufacturer, I mean, what are they doing? What are they doing besides grinding up some food and putting it in a in a jar? There's just are they doing like real trials? Are they proving or demonstrating anything? They've had a long time to to do this and really kind of make the case for for feeding corals. You know, reed mariculture provides um, feeds for aquaculture, right? So those have been demonstrated because if they, you don't have certain types of phytoplankton for larval fish or uh, different shellfish, you're, you're just not going to get them through, you know. Um, so they've kind of already have kind of that track record. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to see more. Uh, evidence and demonstration like we know what it does but uh, this microalgae versus that microalgae like do we really need to add those to a reef tank you know unless you're trying to grow sponges and feather dusters or you know like our, you know a great example for me is my uh, christmas tree worm rocks i got like six of them i probably have like 200 christmas tree worms which you're going to get to see in a few months yeah um they don't care they don't care and and the way that i know that i'm feeding them enough is i see their poops they have these perfect little thin noodles that they <laughs> that they spit out when i f- feed them pretty good but i've s- i've watched them eat i've watched the uh, coral hermits eat and obviously those are much more complex than corals um they just they don't care if it fits it fits <laughs> Very cool, man. Well, I think we uh, we talked a lot about the, the nutrition angle of, of reef aquariums. I'm sure there's some people who are more invested in it who, who wish we'd hit certain topics, but this is a good time to pop those comments down below in our YouTube video. And if you're listening to this on any one of your podcasters, um, I know we're on iTunes and Spotify and a few others. So I guess I think I've listened to podcasts for a long time, so I'm pretty sure we're supposed to ask our viewers to give us a rating and stuff. If you like it, you know, give us a rating to share it with your friends. I know a lot of people are getting some benefits and just maybe not the answers. We're not we're not giving answers, but more like thought provoking topics and ideas to, you know, enrich your uh, reef keeping experience. Yeah, I mean, for for me, that's what I liked about our discussion so far. And some of the comments resonated with me of, you know, if you're just doing something like working on your reef tank, right? And you want to tune in and, and have that philosophical discussion going on in your ear about, you know, feeding. Uh, I don't want to sit here and tell you how to set up a f- tank, you know, or anything like that, because there's a million ways to do it. And, you know, I'm more excited to talk about the just the, the, the particulars of something. And, and um, so I'm glad people enjoy that kind of format. I mean, there's a bazillion places to go you know, figure out what kind of skimmer to buy. Um, Yes, uh, I I don't think that this is the place for that so far, at least. I don't know that there's a discussion to be had anymore. I think we've reached peak protein skimmer, but I'm glad I'm not the only one who likes to work on my reef tank while consuming reef aquarium content. That's fun. And I've only heard that since we put out the reef therapy. I'm sure people have been doing it for a long time, but yeah, man, I will listen to some videos, even if they're not in a podcast format, just, hear people just discussing different things but even with our discussions like for days and weeks later i'm still thinking of topics oh i should have said this i should have said that so we're definitely gonna have the part two on the reef aquarium uh misconception so mark so glad you're coming out here in a couple months we're gonna have to do something special -er than usual yeah Um, i got my second dose of the vaccine on friday i got my tickets booked for uh this summer so I'm, i'm looking forward to seeing the studio in person Oh, my God. It's going to blow your mind. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the session of Reef Therapy. Um, definitely give us some, some ideas and things you want to talk about because we have our own lineup. We're going we're gonna to do this, but if, you have, if you're vocal enough, we might be able to uh, you know, put together some episodes and some sessions that deal with your particular topic. So um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, and we'll catch you guys on the next one. All right, man. Good talking All to right. you again. Later, guys.